Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth? Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder of Streamlined Properties and the team leader of Streamlined Properties on Market, brokered by eXp Realty. Whether you are looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. You guys are in for a treat today. This episode with Sarah Weaver is going to knock your socks off. She's going to explain to you how she helps her clients and how she helped herself live a big and exciting life through real estate investing. You're going to be shocked at all the stuff that she's accomplished in just a couple years. I can't wait for you to hear. Before we get to the episode, if you could just do me a favor If you really like the show and you're listening all the time, make sure you go up to the top in Apple Podcasts, click that plus button, and subscribe. Subscribing really helps us scale across the board against other podcasts. And I can just tell you, from me to you, I really appreciate anybody who's listening. And that's from the bottom of my heart. But now you need to buckle up and get ready for Sarah Weaver. This is episode 27 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Sarah Weaver. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. But first, I'm going to just read in your bio, and it is really interesting. So I hope the listeners are ready for a good one. Sarah is a coach, speaker, real estate investor, and real estate entrepreneur. She went from three to 15 units in 90 days across four states. And you're going to hear about more of her travels along the way. She self-manages her properties, including nine furnished rentals at the time of this bio, using both short-term and mid-term rental strategy, which you're also going to hear about because Sarah co-wrote the book, 30 Day Stay with Ziana McIntyre, our guest on episode 25. She hosts retreats for entrepreneurs and real estate investors to level up their portfolio and runs seminars for real estate brokerages to inspire real estate agents to focus on building their own portfolios. Last thing, she also launched Aria Design, which helps short-term rental owners get the job done on furnishing their rentals. That's a lot, Sarah. When did you get into this and how did you get so deep so quickly? Yeah, anytime I see a problem in the industry, I think, ooh, I'll create a business and I'll fix that. So when I saw people needed help furnishing from afar, started Aria Design. When people kept asking me, how on earth do you buy real estate from anywhere in the world? I started the mentorship program. And then last but not least, people told me that they were lonely, craved community connection, and they wanted to travel. So I created Invested Adventures. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't even know where to start, but let's start all the way back with your first foray into real estate. I know you started as a real estate agent, but is that when you also got your start in investing? That is when I first learned about investing. I read The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss about the same time I decided to become a real estate agent, which is really funny because I don't think people think of Tim Ferriss and real estate sales. And so I really quickly realized that I needed a job where I could work from anywhere. And real estate sales was not quite that that I envisioned. And so I started working for a company where we helped real estate agents grow their admin team. And that's not really of any interest to your listeners, except that what it meant was I could work from anywhere. Yeah. So in 2016, way before COVID, I bought a one-way ticket to Medellin, Colombia, spent three months working from there. And that's when I was like, okay, this is it. I want to travel for at least the foreseeable future. And I want passive income. So then that's when I tapped back into real estate investing. Yeah, it's interesting, though. I like what you brought up because I read Four Hour Work Week again, probably around the same time as I got my license almost 10 years ago. And I was looking at it similar to you. I was just trying to figure out how I could apply the principles. And you, over time, have kept applying them in different ways, but then brought in the income part as well. What was it about real estate that you thought was going to be a good vehicle for that income? Was it books or something that you learned when you started in real estate? 
My story is really just like real estate's always been a whisper. So I grew up playing on job sites. My dad's always worked for new home builders. My mom used to clean new construction homes before 2008. Then when 2008 happened, building stopped. So my dad started doing remodels and my mom started cleaning normal residential homes. And so I know a lot about homes and how to build them just from growing up the way that I did. But that didn't mean I was going to be a real estate investor. I hope people hear from that. Like, I I love my parents dearly and they're blue collar. They're working with their hands. And my grandfather told me, he said, Sarah, work with your head, not your hands. And so it was years later that I was like, you know, I do know a lot about houses and my dad knows a lot about construction, so I can always bug him. He stopped answering my calls for a while there. <laughs> <laughs> you got like a little too much too soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, she always wants something. <laughs> but I just wanted his knowledge. I wasn't asking for money. <laughs> yeah. And so then it wasn't until I met people who were doing this that I was like, oh, they're on to something. And then working with wealthy real estate agents, I noticed all of the really wealthy ones owned real estate. Yep. I always say it. And I've told my whole team, I have a big team of 50 on market agents, and we want them all to learn to become investors. We're training them all. But similar to what you're saying, you have the access, the opportunity, and you can understand what the ARV is for properties. You should all be investing if you have license. And even if you're an investor who gets their license, then you have alternative ways to use the license to help yourself and your family and friends. Yeah, it's a great point. So what was your first investment? Which was the was the one that got you going on it? It was a single family, a 1942 Cape Cod in Prairie Village, Kansas, a town named so cute. It sounds like something out of a Christmas movie. And it Prairie really does. Village, <laughs> it's so cute. Yeah, I bought this house. I took the entire upstairs down to the studs and took it from a three bedroom, one and a half bath to a four bedroom, two bath, and then rented out the rooms to essentially roommates. I called it the rent by the room strategy to sound fancy, but really I just had roommates. And then I became the best roommate. I'm the one that paid the mortgage, but then I left and I was never there. So I spent most of that year traveling around Europe, a little bit of South America. And that's when I got hooked. Yeah. So were you living in Kansas at the time or was part of your principle to move to the area where you wanted to basically do a room by room house hack? I never thought I would be back in Kansas. I went to high school in Kansas against my best judgment. I went to state school and I studied abroad actually summer after freshman year. Like I was always the kid that wanted to get out. I had posters of Australia on my walls as a kid. I wanted to go far away. And then I learned, oh, University is expensive. (laughs) And okay, in state tuition sounds great. So I wanted to go far away. And so my first job after university was in Germany. Then I worked in Florida. Then I taught English in Korea. Then I followed love to Texas and followed love to Colorado. So I was living in Denver at the time when I decided, okay, now's the time to buy real estate. And Kansas City just made sense at the time. I think you did something that I've talked about a lot. I think that the first investment, if you want it to be out of state, you should be making a list of all the places you've ever lived first and then all the places where you have family or friends. Just you have just a tiny advantage over some place you have no idea. Did that help you when choosing Kansas for a first one? It was a huge help. My dad's ability to give me contacts for contractors was how I saved so much money on that renovation. It was a down to the studs renovation was my very first experience in real estate. Yeah, you definitely talked about that in 30 day stay also, right? I remember this part. Yeah. So so, yeah, so his knowledge really helped me save money and headache. But know that you guys after that, I never bought a property again that needed that much renovation or tapped into my parents like for their expertise or money. And so it's definitely not a necessity, but I think what you were saying is making that list, write down what are your advantages. And so my advantage was having a dad that can look at a photo and know that's gonna cost $8,000 to repair and this is how you do it. That was a huge help. And he's far less interested in doing it again. <laughs> yeah, but that it's a great point. I think a lot of new investors are not using the skills that they've built in their own prior businesses as well. 
to say, okay, if you're good at data, then you can be really good at data. <laughs> if you are a contractor, have a background, and that's going to help you do better than some of us who are just not handy and want to hire it out. And you had your dad who you know you could bring in, and then you can take the knowledge from him to move it on to the next projects. So what happened with that first property? Did you Do you still own it or did you sell it at some point? No, I still have it. Oh, and I awesome. actually did, I didn't know what I knew then. So I still haven't refinanced that little guy, which I should have of, at some point. Yeah. So my Not goal now, is, not now. Well, exactly, <laughs> not right now, at some point. And so, yep, yeah, still just have a lot of equity in that house. And it's running as a long-term unfurnished rental. It's doing really well, like cash flow, about $800 conservatively. And I love that little house. And here's why I love it is eventually I will take all my hard earned, you know, hard work and I'll tear that sucker down and I'll build a brand new build on that lot because that's why I bought in that neighborhood. I bought in that neighborhood because I knew I would have about four or five different exit strategies. One of them being that what they're doing in that street in particular is they're tearing these houses down and building these monstrosities that take up the entire lot. Yeah. And those are going for in the 900s. I think one across the street went for 1.1 million. You yeah. guys have bought mine for $200,000. Yeah. But that's real estate investing is really all the money is all made on the buy side. You obviously can do a great renovation, but everything's about what you're getting it for and how you identify the neighborhoods. Again, you used your own personal expertise at understanding the areas and what was going to happen there. And I think that's something that I was always good at. I just invested a lot in single families that I lived in. And people don't think that's like an investment strategy. But if you know how to buy, you can turn around and double your money. And I like to flip on the back end, like I leave and then I flip at the end. Yep, a live and flip. Yeah. So what was after that one? When did you get into the second property? And when did short term or midterm start coming into it? Yeah, so my beginning was really slow. And it's funny, people always ask, like, do you wish you would have bought faster? But here's what's really cool. I bought that house that we're talking about. And then I bought a one way ticket to Argentina the (laughs) following year. And so I was living my absolute dream life. I had a job where I could work fully remotely and I was still working full time for a W2. Yeah. But I was living abroad, learning Spanish and collecting rent from that property. And so I was in no necessarily hurry to buy my next one. So it took another two years for me to buy property number two. And I brought an up down duplex about 20 miles away from that first house in definitely a more B class, even B minus neighborhood. And again, it cash flows about the same, about $800. And then it wasn't until after that property that I was like, oh, okay, Jonathan, I'm an investor now. Yeah, And that's yeah. when everything changed. Yeah. Just in, for the second property, did you feel that the 20 minute drive was just about as far as you wanted to go? A lot of new investors are trying to figure out, you know, how close the properties need to be to be able to touch them. I was listening to something the other day. It was probably a podcast. And somebody said like 45 minutes. If it's 45 minutes, you're probably never going to go. <laughs> and if it's 30 minutes, you probably might not go as much as you think. But like 20 minutes is pretty good. It's easy to get to, easy to get back. Was that part of your thought process at the time? Not at all. I was living (laughs) in Brazil when I went under contract and then spent the like all of due diligence. I was in Mexico. And then let me think the timing. I think five days after I closed, I bought a one-way ticket to Southeast Asia. No, the location of that property didn't matter. It was my on-the-ground team. So I had two real estate agents sending me deals. And so it was whoever sent me the best deal fastest that I could go under contract on. And that's why I bought that property. Yeah. And at that point, after doing the first renovation and taking off, you knew what to look for through photos and you know the area well enough to be able to do it. And I knew I didn't, I was open to doing renovation because I had the knowledge and the experience, but I didn't want to. If I could buy something relatively turnkey, that's what I wanted. And that's what I did. Yeah. I mean, explain that for the listeners though, because now you know, and you have so much experience. Why do you choose not to ever do as much reno as the first one? I obviously know the answer because I'm in the middle of a renovation and I always am, but I always (laughs) wonder like, maybe I should just buy the easier ones. This is a lot. For me, it was the deals were just so good at the time. Like that deal, I did owner occupied home ready program 3% down and it cash flowed, gosh, I think like $1,000 a month. And so it was already a 72% cash on cash return. Yeah. 
I was like, why would I not choose easy? My job was really demanding at the time and I was traveling full time. And so I chose like my mental health over probably like having a crushing deal that would have required three months of renovations and a lot of stress. I just wasn't ready for that at the time. Whereas now I am willing to do a big renovation because I'm not seeing 72% cash on cash deals with seven and a half percent interest right now. And so it was really a mark of the time is I wanted to enjoy my life and good. You could swing a bat and hit seven good deals at the time. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like now probably you have the, obviously the mindset that you've worked over the time to be able to be free, but also know that you can handle the projects. And I think like new investors who take on too much always regret it. Because they're just trying to get too many too soon. And I know we'll talk about that when we get to the questions, but I think that's out there. So how did the scale go? Because you really started to get a lot going after that second one. What happened that jettisoned you into that area where you could keep going, knowing you're still going to travel all the time? Yeah, I think the biggest difference was identity. I started identifying as a real estate investor. And so I started thinking, what does a real estate investor do? They analyze deals. They're networking constantly. I really like people. So that was came really naturally. I joined a mastermind and just was constantly talking about real estate investing. And it still took another year and a half until I really grew my portfolio. So all of 2020, so November 2019 is when I bought property number two. And then 2020 was just a year of frustration. I couldn't get anything under contract. I was distracted. I was writing offers in nine different markets. And I was doing everything you shouldn't do. (laughs) And then thankfully in 2021, everything changed. Yeah. Why do you think everything changed for you? Was it a mindset shift, market shift, or all of the above? It was a mindset shift. It was someone told me, knock it off. You're trying to do a burr, a short-term rental, house hack, out of state, (laughs) long distance, all these things all at the same time. No wonder you're not getting anywhere. And what's so cool is that I'll like tease. In 2021, I bought 12 units. I did debt partnership, equity partnership, hard money, private money, conventional loan, house hack, medium-term rental, short-term rental, and long-distance burr. And so I did do it all, but not all at the same time. And so you have to focus on one thing at a time. Then two weeks later, you can focus on the next thing. It can be really fast, but I got focused. Yeah. And it's, I love diversity in a profile, like in an investing profile. I think it just helps you, like you said before about exit strategies. I think of that as a whole portfolio. I want diversified assets just like I would have in stocks. And it seems like you focused on that. It's just that you were focusing on too many at the same time, like you said in 2020. Yeah. I was getting so distracted. And so the moment I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to house hack in Omaha and then I'm going to do a burr and I'm going to do it in that order. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. When you do your house hacks, are you holding, you're going to, this is what I'm guessing. And also from what I read in 30 Day Stay, you're going to do house hacks. You know, you're going to travel. So you're also going to house hack your own unit in a multi with a roommate or roommates. And then you're going to have that as your mailing address to make sure you're good for the loan. And then you're going to take off and quote, leave your room empty. Exactly. Yeah. It's a great strategy. And I think it's something that people don't think about as much. That if you're doing it the right way, you can bring in roommates in your property and obviously rent out the other unit, but also be free to go have the fun and traveling the world that you're doing, which I think everybody wants to do. Yeah, it's been really wonderful. So when did you get into short term and midterm? Because I think that is obviously you guys just finished the book on 30 day stay and the midterm is really popular now. It's been something I, I've thought about for a long time. I've done short term rentals for a long time, but midterm is interesting to me in the current climate after what happened in the pandemic. Exactly. So that very next number three was a fourplex. And I ended up moving into the top unit. And it was wild. I actually haven't told this story to very many people. I always forget that this even happened. The tenants below me just left in the middle of the night. Like how soon into the lease? I mean, they still had seven months left on their lease. Ended up being the coolest blessing because I was living in the top unit. I was actually physically there for that week that they left actually, which is wild that I wasn't traveling. And I was like, 
okay. And so I like called a property manager, asked her like what I needed to do legally. And then I got that sucker cleaned and furnished like within days and listed it on Airbnb and had it rented by a traveling nurse like within, gosh, I think 22 days was wow. the whole process. And I hustled. I was terrible. Like I was cleaning dog feces yeah, yeah. off the wall. It was awful. <laughs> no it was like, man, about... being abroad way better than this shit, yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> what, <laughs> what led you to do the midterm then, or what? even if it was a planned short-term and furnished, was it some, from the masterminds? or ha- I can't remember at what point you met somebody who put the MTR in your head. Was it before that? Yeah, no, it was just demand. I listed on Airbnb thinking that I'd get guests on the weekends. I'm like, who comes to Omaha, Nebraska? Yeah. And I thought maybe I'd get people on the weekends or was excited to then catch the College World Series demand because the College World Series is in Omaha. And I was like, oh, cool. I'll hurry and get this furnished before that happens. But then my very first inquiry was from a traveling nurse. That is so interesting because that was really before the time when it all started to become so obvious that traveling nurses, and they're still the biggest tenants for midterm. And now I own that fourplex. I bought the fourplex next door. Right. And only one of the eight units is a long-term all seven of the others are now medium term rentals and they're all nurses. Yeah, you definitely went over it in the book, but please explain to the listeners how much it helps you to have seven short term, midterm rentals right next to each other when you're getting the inquiries on the sites. Having those extra options is such a huge win for you, right? It's such a win. A great example. This just happened two days ago. I have a guy in my unit. His name's Christian. And Christian messaged me, Can I extend? And I said, oh, dude, I'm so sorry. Someone's moving in right after you. Again, like patting myself on the back. I'm an amazing investor. (laughs) I said, but, or, and I have a unit coming vacant and it'll, and it overlaps. So it actually worked out great. I said, so unfortunately you're going to have to move units, which I know is a pain. I'm so sorry. But great news is you're going to get brand new sheets, clean unit. And he said, oh, that sounds great. And then because it has unfinished basements, he can easily just put his things in the basement to make a really like easy transition. Yeah. So that's one example. The other example is that when I'm sourcing for leads on Furnish Finder, like actually looking for tenants, I can source with one listing. So I have one right. listing on Furnish Finder and I'm just constantly getting inquiries and I'm just placing them plug and play into the different units. And because I have multiple units, I can play around even negotiating with the nurses. Hey, will you move in a couple days early and pay this because this unit's available? And they're so excited. Yeah. Furnish Finder was interesting. I, 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 really got a lot of info from both you and Ziana in the book. And can you just explain for the listeners the difference really between how to manage Furnish Finder versus Airbnb? Because there's pros and cons to it, but it seems like you figured out the best way to use Furnish Finder to your advantage. Yeah, what I like about Furnish Finder is it's a listing site. So just like you would list on Facebook Marketplace, Zillow, Craigslist, it's just listing. It's not a booking site like Airbnb. So you can move them off of Furnish Finder. I put them into a property management system called Avail, A-V-A-I-L dot C-O. And I move them off of there. And what's great about Furnish Finder is that it's not just travel nurses. There's all sorts right. of people that know to go there for essentially corporate housing. And they don't take any fees. That one listing cost me $99 for the whole year. But then when I set someone up on a lease at $1,875, guess what? I'm getting $1,875. So I net more if I book through Furnish Finder. And it takes more admin time. I'm checking references. I'm That's checking, what I was going to ask. I have to write up a lease. Every turnover takes at least 45 minutes of like computer time. And so when I get that booking through Airbnb, I'm like, woohoo because no time at all. And so there's pros and cons to both. Yeah, but that's exactly why you use both to your advantage. Exactly. And they don't communicate with each other. So you do have to be really careful. You don't want to have instant book on when you're getting close to close on a furnished finder tenant. So there is admin time. I want to be really clear that medium term rental strategy is not passive. So if you're looking to spend more time with your wife and kids, probably not the best strategy for you unless you're going to then hire people, which is what I've done. So I've grown to a point where it makes sense. I now have a full-time staff person who handles all of this for me. 
Yeah, but I think you have to get to a certain level. Like I think people who want to get in and pay for the passivity too early, they're not going to make enough money to ever get out. You have to really be the admin for a while, understand the process so you can train your admin to do it exactly the way that you want it. Exactly. And there's so many options. You could have someone that just answers messages on nights and weekends, and that could be a virtual assistant in the Philippines or down in South America. There's so many beautiful options to making this more passive, but it is not passive. No, I agree. I don't think really any real estate investing is truly passive unless it's like syndications where you are in LP and you don't have any say of anything. Everything else, you have to eventually get to the point where you're paying for people to manage it. And the big questions are still going to come to you at some point, but it's definitely more passive than doing a flip. That's not passive at all. Exactly. Yeah, that down to the studs reno, that was not passive. No, it never is. Okay, I want to get into a few of the questions that I sent you before, and I'll give you what you wrote, because I know you filled it out. You had such great answers in here. And I think there's so much in here that can really help people understand that this is a longer journey than just maybe what they think trying to get one, two, three doors. I want to hop to this part with what's wrong with the real estate investing world right now, because we so agree. Explain peacocking and why it bothers you and why you think it's a problem, because I agree 100 percent. Yeah, I think one of the problems, I love social media. I think it has brought me the coolest friends. It gives you access to authors and podcast hosts and people that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. And the problem with social media is it's really easy for people to say, look at me, look at me. I bought 50 units. I bought 10 units. I bought this. And there's so much that goes into it. Like, for example, my last three deals, I used equity partners on them. And so I'm sure when people are like, wow, she bought a bunch of real estate. If everyone thought I put 20% down every time, they'd be like, the math doesn't add up. How could she make 50,000? but then put $80,000 down on all these properties. It's because I didn't. I didn't do that. And so one of the things that I I love talking about is peacocking. I actually got this from a friend of mine, Tammy Ritchie, who's an incredible investor. Definitely find her on Instagram. She's super cool. And she's the one that that talks about peacocking all the time. And so peacocking is like puffing up your chest and putting out your feathers and just look at me. Look how amazing of an investor I am. I don't ever want to be known for that. I want to be known for like, oh yeah, Sarah talks about how much she cries and how frustrated she gets and the hard parts of real estate investing. And then she talks about why she does it and why it's so fun and how much she gets to travel. And, you know, I get to hang out with my grandma on a Tuesday. How lucky am I that I don't have to ask permission from a boss to do that? Right. But I mean, because that's the end game. People who get into investing, there's a reason they want to get into investing and have passive income. It's to do what you're already doing, which is the four hour work week principle. I think it's so interesting, though, the peacocking is so generally associated with the amount of doors. And I've always said that doors are crazy because unless you own 100 percent of a door, I wouldn't count it as a one door. You know, if you only own 10% of one door, I would count it as 0.1. So you have 100 (laughs) units and you only own 10%. That's 10 doors to me, in my opinion. So I like the way that you think and the way that you express it, because I don't think the doors are really the important part. It's exactly what you want to do with your life. And are you accomplishing it? Can you help other people accomplish that? And that's what you're doing now, right? Helping other people do what you've done. And that's what I want people to talk about more. It's like, how much time did you spend on the people and the things that you love this year? I'll admit that the first six months of this year, I worked so much. Like I was just I was made myself so available. The Bigger Pockets podcast came out. I was writing my book. I was managing my properties. I had one part-time employee. Now I have up to five contractors at all times, like working on different things. And so I was just really stressed. And so it was cool that I added a bunch of properties to my portfolio and I loved the increase income, but I was really stressed. Whereas now I'm ending 2022. This is the most peace I have ever felt. I am so stinking happy. And it's because I've prioritized my mental health. Yeah, it's not spoken about enough in general anywhere in any business, but it's the most important piece of growing any business is if can you take care of yourself along the way or else you're going to be subject to burnout. And real estate investors, I don't think they're they think about burnout, but like you just said, it's real. 
And too many people go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to replace my two job with this investing thing and it's going to be cool. And then they realize they're working double the hours that they did at the W-2, right? That's so common. I have a story about that in, oh gosh, when would it have been? Last summer, so summer 2021 or fall, I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to circa 2017 do a renovation again. I slept on an air mattress in my (laughs) unit that I was burying. I went to Habitat for Humanity Restore about nine times, Home Depot 30 times. And I was like, what am I doing? Because here's the difference is if you're doing a renovation in a town that you live in, you're hopefully showering and then you're going to dinner with a friend or you're meeting up, you know, at a brewery with your girlfriend or whatever you're doing, right? I was alone in a town that I didn't know anyone. And I was laying on an air mattress being like, what happened? Like, well, this was the worst idea I've ever had. And thankfully, it was fixable. Like, I was able to get out of it pretty easily. I was like, well, we're hiring a GC for this and I'm getting on a plane. But it is really funny. Sometimes you have ideas, then they're terrible ideas. Yeah, but you have to be strong enough to recognize when it's a bad idea and figure out the exit strategy to either get yourself out and rid yourself of the project or to do what you did, hire people to come in so you could go back to doing what you want to do. Absolutely. Today's episode is brought to you by Streamline Properties On Market, brokered by eXp Realty. That is actually my on-market real estate team. We have close to 50 real estate agents in four states, primarily in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. We work with traditional buyers and sellers and all investors, no matter what you're looking to do in real estate investing, we have you covered. You can get all the information you need at our website, which is www.streamlinedwithad.properties. One of your greatest influence in real estate, you said, Chad Carson, tell us about that. I loved what you wrote, but I want you to get it out to the listeners because it's so important about the small but mighty portfolio. Yes, I love what Chad Carson puts out there. So Chad, he tells it, of course, so much better, but essentially he bought a bunch of real estate and then was like, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Like he (laughs) he bought too much. Maybe they weren't the right deals. And then he realized it so doesn't matter how many doors you have. It's about how much cash flow you have. And so what I love about Chad Carson is he focuses so much on living a really big life. So his wife, I believe she's lived in South America. She's fluent in Spanish. And so they took like a mini retirement and they took their two small children and lived in, I believe, Ecuador. And they did that a few years ago. Then he came back. He created more content for real estate, you know, stabilized some more properties. And now today they're living in Spain for a whole year. And their two young kids are going to international school. And I'm not trying to convince everyone to travel. That is not, it's not for everyone. Chad and I both love travel, but it's not for everyone. But I think what I love about Chad's story is that he talks about the small but mighty portfolio. And so I'm not going around saying that I own 19 units. I'm not saying that's a lot of units. I know a ton of investors that own way more units than that. And I hit my cash flow goal at like 16 units. Yeah. And I think that's what Chad really focuses on. And then talking about how living a really big life, really knowing what that looks like. So he and his wife set out and they're like, okay, this is what we want our life to look like. We want to be able to pick up and go live and drop our lives in any country and really make it work. They're not traveling. They live in Spain this year. And I just think that is so cool. Yeah. And you've taken that on. You obviously love to travel. How many different countries was it in 2022 that you visited or stayed in? Yeah. In 2022 this year, gosh, I mean, I was gone out of the U.S. for over eight months because I track it. Because if you're gone for 330 days, there's this incredible tax benefit. So I was gone for eight months this year. Mm -hmm. And in total, I've traveled to 46 countries on six continents. Wow. That's awesome. You're doing like things in tandem that I think people want to do. So this is really important for them to hear that you can do it. And are you still working W2 or now are you doing all of these companies that we talked about in the beginning that are generating the income that you need to go with your income from real estate? Yeah. So now I have income coming in from the three different businesses. So I have Aria Design Services. We furnish Airbnbs for other investors. Essentially what happened, Jonathan, is I posted a photo of my unit in Omaha while I was still in New Zealand. And I'm like, look, I furnished a unit. And people were like, what? How did you do that? Can you do it for me? 
And I remember being like, no, nope. yeah. <laughs> was like my first thought. And then I was like, no, wait a minute. What would an entrepreneur do? And I had read Who Not How. Yep, and so I was I like, love all right. That book. And, and so I started a business, Aria Design Services. We've furnished 37 units in 12 states this year alone. Wow. And just go over briefly how the process works. If someone wants to use you guys for that service, because it's so great, what do they do? And then how do you handle it? How quick can it be done? Yeah. So everyone wants it done in three days. Please give <laughs> us please give us weeks of notice, you guys, because we are curating a design for you. So there's there's three different ways you can work with us. You can buy our furnish list for $99. It includes every link to every item we buy. Highly recommend it. If you're a DIY investor, do that. The $99 is super worth it. So take the list, furnish it yourself. That's just everything to furnish. They just click the links. It gets sent to the house. They put it together. They handle all that. But it's the full list of everything that they need. Exactly. And it's not a cold document. We are in there updating. every week updating it. If we find a better solution, if I put together a dresser and I absolutely hated it, it's <laughs> never going to be on that list. And so trust me, there's nightstands where I've wanted to throw the nightstand yes, out the window. I'm very um, familiar. So, <laughs> so that list is awesome for a DIY investor. Then the next tier that you could do working with us is we will have an actual curated design for your unit. So if you have no desire to do any design or any decision making, you need help and you want this off your plate, we can help you. We will design the unit and this is called awesome from afar. And so we are doing this from afar. All of the items will get shipped either to your unit or to whoever's going to install yep. the things into the unit and you or your hire are going to install. Surprisingly, 90% of our clients choose to do that. They find a really good way, either they want to fly in and do it, or they hire task rabbit people or a property manager. But about 95% of our clients choose that. Yeah. And then the full service is we will fly out and we are doing the install for you. And then that includes everything. We're writing your listing description, your house manual, your automated messages. We're also analyzing properties for investors. So yeah. if you're not even here yet, maybe you have a property in your portfolio that you're like, Sarah, would this be a good short-term, medium-term rental? We'll also analyze your deals. I think we charge two forty dollars for that. So really anywhere in the process, analyze your deal, furnish the deal, and launch your furnish rental. We can help you with the whole process. That's so important though. I mean, you really hit all three things. Obviously the furnishing is so important because now it's so visually peelable online for people to see and be able to, you know, because for Airbnb, you're booking without seeing it. It's not a regular rental. So the photos have to stand for what the property is going to be has to be an experience. But then the listing description, which I believe is so important, even for regular properties, is so important to catch people's eye. And then, of course, the management of the property, getting it up and ready, intake and everything like that. How have you found that it's been to help people automate the process for them or teach them how to do it in terms of the rewards that they're going to get from that? Because it's really huge. It's huge. So a great story is my client, Jason. He came to me, I met him at Bigger Pockets last year, so 2021. And he told me, he said, it's my goal to retire my wife. And so they bought, they actually owned a property, used to be their primary. They've moved out of it. It was a long-term rental. He goes, I think this is going to be a kick-ass furnished rental. So he hired us. We flew out there, we furnished it. And then I actually sat with Alyssa and taught her everything that I know about pricing software, automated messages, how yeah. to manage it. So now she manages that short-term rental. They since did another one, which they hired us to furnish. And she manages someone else's short-term rental and she quit her job this year. Yeah, I've actually seen that a lot. People who get good at the management then can take on those co-management positions for short-term rentals and do phenomenal. And it's a huge win-win for the manager and for the owner of the property. Exactly. It is so neat. And so I love what I do. It's so fun, especially when you do it in person and you're getting paid to shop. That part's really fun. You make something beautiful, but that's not what it's about. For me, it's we're creating a beautiful space that people are going to enjoy. And then the cash flow that it creates for my clients, that's the biggest reward for me. Is It's so exciting to hear stories like Jason and Alyssa. Yeah. So talk about a few of the other things that you do with your businesses, because I think it's really interesting that you figured out ways to make multiple things happen that are all tied together, but they can really help investors go from one to the other also. 
Yeah. So I travel the country speaking at brokerages, real estate brokerages, because as real estate agents, they don't invest. 5% of real estate agents own investment Mine do, but I don't know why everybody doesn't. It's crazy. (laughs) So I'm on a mission to change that. So please have me in to talk to your agents as well. I, I travel the country talking to real estate agents. And then in addition to that, I then coach. And so these real estate agents, I get them stoked to invest. But then there's so many questions that people have along the way. It's not just, okay, I want to invest. Now I know what to do. No, you have to know what to do. Also, once you go into due diligence, once you buy a property, how do you scale? All of these things. And I used to do a 12-week coaching cohort. And it was great. I had clients go under contract. I provide connections with investor-friendly agents. I teach them how to analyze deals, how to get funding, how to do everything. And it's not enough. 12 weeks is too fast. And so I've moved to a year-long program. And so now I have mentees who join me. It's open enrollment, so you can join anytime. And it's a year. And it is one of my greatest joys. I get to hang out with real estate investors who are awesome. Like they're not, some of them are beginners, but most of them aren't beginners. You know, they're like, Hey, Sarah, I see what you're doing and I want to do the same thing. So I have someone that lives in an RV. I have someone that they want to go live in Mexico for a year. People who are really attracted to the freedom piece and likely out of state investing. So we, we talk a lot about out of state investing in my mentorship program. Have you found what I have? We do events and we do similar things, but the camaraderie between investors when for new and experienced investors, just to be able to meet up and not be pitched at something and really just connect and learn about what you do is what is the real thing that propels people to get more properties. We've seen people do 14 doors in a year and no problem, but it helped them to just know that other people like them can do it. Is that what you find in these cohorts and why it's more important to do a year? Absolutely. It's because you're going to have a question on deal number five that was never an issue on deal number two. The thing that happened for me was I had this crystal clear deal criteria that I sent to an agent. He got me a property. I went under contract. I was like, bada boom, bada bang. But then I sent the deal criteria to another agent. And to my surprise, he sent me a deal that worked like right away. And I'm like, crap, I can't do both at the same time. I don't have enough money. And my accountability group was like, you dummy, borrow, find a private lender, an equity partner, whatever you need to do, but you have to make this work because this is a kick ass deal. And they were right. And so that is the community that I'm cultivating with the mentees is really a way for them to come in those moments where they're like, ah, I don't know how to make this work. And together we will surround them and make sure that they can do it. That's it right there, though. It's together because you can be the leader and the one that people are looking to. But what happens is you get people at all different levels of experience that then can help each other. So, you, you know, you there's always a time issue, but there's other people all working together to try to figure out what that is. How many people are in the year long program at a time around? Around 50. So I think I have wow, 45 okay. right now. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's yeah. Group. And that really is the size I wanted. I didn't want smaller. It sounds better. Like people are like, oh, that's too many people. No, you want that many people because the, when you raise your hand and you say, hey, has anyone flipped? Has anyone wholesaled? Has anyone used a DSCR lender? If you're only in a room with 12 students, there's not going to be a yes. But when you have 50, there's always going to be someone that's had that experience. And so it has been the coolest thing that I do. And we're seeing results. People are buying more real estate because they joined the program. And that's really exciting. Yeah, that's amazing. I want to grab one more thing from the questions. Most important trait for real estate investor. It's pretty clear from what you're saying that you have this, but explain why grit is so important. And I know you mentioned Atomic Habits, which is a book in one of our years of the book club on my team, but also Angela Lee Duckworth's TED Talk Grit. And I believe she has a book called Grit also. So explain on your end why it's so important for you and why you probably telling everybody in your trainings and coachings like this is what you really need to have. Yeah. Grit is really hard to explain. It's like when you see it, you know. And so I always steal James Clear's definition because he's amazing. His book, Atomic Habits, is phenomenal. I highly recommend. And so Clear defines it as grit is the perseverance and passion to achieve long-term goals. Sometimes you will hear grit referred to as mental toughness. 
And man, I can't think of anything more long term than real estate. Yeah. I think people think that we're so rich. And I always say, yeah, I'm not rich yet <laughs> because real estate is long term. Like it's a long term goal. There's not a lot of dopamine hits when you're a real estate investor. Getting under contract always feels good. I love negotiating, but it's the grit required to deal with my ceiling fell through in one of my units. Tenant is angry with me. Another tenant fled in the middle of the night. I had to be gritty to keep persevering and going. Yeah, I think that we see the results of people who don't have it, or maybe they got in with short term mentality, because that's what you see on the market. These quarter done, half done flips, they got in over their head and they thought it was a 20,000 reno and they spent 20,000 in the first week. And then they're like, what am I going to do now? I've literally done nothing. You have I, a I shell. bought one of those, actually. Yeah. My, my third property was a kind of a failed slip, if you want to call it that. Yeah, I like them. It's just that where I live in New Jersey, the failed flip, they're still trying to sell it for like, you were like, we all know that you screwed up. So why are you trying to sell this for like way more than you can get? No one's going to buy it. It's crazy. So yeah. do you have a home base now? Or are you really just like a nomad? I'm fully nomadic. That's so awesome. in the last, I don't even know, nine weeks, 10 weeks, I've been in San Diego, Bangkok, Phoenix, Kansas City, New Jersey, New York, Iceland, Amsterdam, Guatemala, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. I mean, people are just salivating at trying to figure <laughs> out how to do this, but it all started really with four hour work week for you, which it did for a lot of people. But I think it's really interesting how you turned it into real estate and the lifestyle. Do you think that regular real estate investors, I think, can get a huge amount out of four hour work week because it's more about how you detach from the nine to five and then it's what what vehicle you want to put in to be the thing that's going to make the money? The most successful real estate investors that I'm seeing and even hanging out with now is they delegate. They delegate to cold callers, people to write their mailers, even in-house property managers, virtual assistants. You have to delegate so that you're doing the highest income producing task. And that's where I get a lot of that from the four-hour work week. And so I'm so grateful I read that book when I did. But if you haven't read it and you're listening to this podcast, please pick it up. I highly, Absolutely. highly recommend it. Yeah. And you're also talking about the principles of Who Not How, which is Dan Sullivan and Dr. Benjamin Hardy. And that book was just like, I, like you kind of know that you need to do it. But then when you read it, you're like, wait, okay, I need to do this. Even for little things, like I, it's just funny on a side note, like, there's things that I always didn't like doing that now I'd never do. And I couldn't be more, like I never go to the grocery store. I just order my groceries because I don't, it takes too long and I'll get way too many snacks. So why do it? And I think that you can take that and just keep moving it out into whatever business that you do to replace yourself. Even if somebody does it 80% as good as me, that means I can focus my energy on something that's gonna have a higher value anyway. Absolutely. And then I wouldn't be serving myself if I didn't talk about probably my favorite business, which is Invested Adventures. Yeah, I want to hear so about this one. So this is really cool, Jonathan. I posted about obviously my travel. Actually, someone in the real estate community was like, you travel a lot. And I was like, yeah, that's the that's point. My thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I invited, I handpicked 11 people and I invited them to an event. I thought maybe investors would be interested in traveling together. And nine of the 11 said yes. And the other two, the only reason they couldn't come was because of pregnancy. And yeah. so even they were like, oh, we really want to come. So I knew I was onto something. And then what's really neat, so that was my very first event. They call themselves the OG Sarah Weaver crew. Yeah, which for I'm sure. I'm not ever going to correct them. I never tell them that it, my company is called Invested Adventures. Yeah. <laughs> Keep calling it that. So the OG, what I love about them is they have added so much real estate. Nine of the 17 went under contract within four weeks of the event. And seven of the nine said they never would have done that had it not been for the event. Yeah, but that's the Myself camaraderie included. thing that we were talking about, though. It's just sometimes you that's why masterminds and meetups are so important. And they have to be the right ones where people really want to help each other because it just gives you the shoulder to shoulder thing like, oh, let's just all do this. That's what did you do on the adventure? So this one was a lot more classroom than any of my events since, which I think really served us because that group, there's not two days that go by without a text in that group chat. Yeah. They are so active. Two of them are actually doing a Burr project together yeah, and someone else in the group is their private lender. 
And so that's the coolest. Like we're all doing deals together. Someone added 13 doors this year when you said someone added 14. Yeah, 14 that you know. was yeah, our record yeah. last year. Yeah, from, and for, Sarah that, added, from added zero 13. to 14 and yours is zero to 13. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's awesome. It's so cool. And so they're doing a lot of real estate. And then since then, I found that people don't, you don't need more content. You don't need more presenters. You need more time outside of your normal life. So now I have trips that are half classroom, half adventure. And I also have trips that are just adventure. So I just got back from five days in Guatemala with 12 real estate investors. We did zip lining, overnight volcano hike, ATV tour, lots of consumption of alcohol. It was (laughs) so fun. And we really got to know each other. And then next month, I'm having a goal setting retreat. I will do that every January now. So that's half classroom, half adventure. And then in February and March, I'm taking two groups to hike the W Trek in Patagonia, Chile. This is so awesome. What's the January goal setting event? In Guatemala. I love Antigua, Guatemala. It's just really special. And we have a private chef that does really cool things. I have a artisan cocktail class that they teach at the Airbnb. We do really cool stuff. And then I actually, so those are all sold out, but I do have an event that I actually just announced yesterday to my wait list. So you can be some of the first to Yeah, hear. let's do it. I'm doing an eight day African safari in Tanzania. <laughs> So, Fall, so cool. followed by an eight day hike of Kilimanjaro. That's insane. This is you so can, awesome. And I mean, both or one. Yeah. And you're getting these are all investors who are going, or are you just getting people who want the adventure as well? It sounds like there's a mix there. They're, so far, everyone's been a real estate investor, either, whether they awesome. own a property or not, they are dedicated to owning real yeah. estate. And yeah. so definitely we want to hang out with real estate investors because it's lonely. The moment you make a decision that you are going to pursue financial independence through real estate investing, your entire friends and family are like, oh God, yeah, don't here do we go it. Again. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Don't ask Talk us for money. Doors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so true. This is really exceptional. I feel like your attitude really shows what you do. And I think it's why you're helping so many people because we can both agree that the real estate investing world can be a little grabby for some, but you're talking about high value things. And I love to talk to people who have programs, coaching, et cetera, who I know personally are delivering the value because they're definitely out there, but there's also out there the scammy ones And you really have to take the time to figure out who, but this is a great way. They can watch this video on YouTube. They can listen to the podcast and know that you're honestly just want to help people and build relationships, which is the way to make it happen for everybody. I love people. Like anyone that knows me can feel it and see it. I really love people. Some people go to conferences or networking events and it empties their cup and they're like, oh my gosh, I need a recharge. By the way, all of those people are my best friends. I love social yeah. introverts. That's me. Um, yeah. That, the, all my best friends are introverts. Yeah. I'm their extrovert. They're my, you know, they like me as their wingman. But for me, those events fill my cup. Like I get energized from these conversations. And so I feel really lucky that what I have to say adds value because for years I was just a talkative kid. And now through discipline and experience, I can now add a lot of value to people with what I'm saying. Yeah, I definitely, I am a really full on introvert INTJ, but I get filled up with knowledge. So like at an event, I literally run back to my hotel room and I just start working. And everyone's like, let's go party. I'm like, I'm good. But socially, yeah, I'm drained. Like, If I speak, I get off the stage and run the hell out of there. Like I just, <laughs> I want to do the connections. I'll wait, finish the connections with everybody. But then there's no, I have to, I have to go. But on the- we would be a really good duo yeah, at conferences because uh, I would be texting you, hey, take this yeah, note exactly. while I'm doing shots at the after after party. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, yeah. And then I what like about it. this brilliant thing that I heard? Yeah. Oh, we got to follow up with Robin. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. And I, I did a build trip in Nicaragua with Give Back Homes. And that was so interesting. It's why I'm so interested in the stuff that you're doing, because real estate is global and you can learn and talk about real estate while understanding when you go out of the country, you understand how privileged we are here by seeing what's out there, but also exploring the areas and being able to do that. It's really amazing. And so how many years have you been doing this? Because it hasn't been that many. 
No, it hasn't. So my first event was January 2021. And so this year we did five events um, in 2022. And next year, 2023, I have three events sold out. And I just announced my fourth event, the Safari. So technically the fifth event will be Kilimanjaro. And then I have probably, I'll do maybe one more. I also just need to like respect my own boundaries. <laughs> yeah. and Get the self-care. Well, and that's why we're doing African Safari is people said, stop doing stuff that you know is going to sell. For example, I took people to Smoky Mountains this year. Yeah. Did Sarah Weaver want to go to the Smoky Mountains? Not really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I knew it would sell. And so this year, 2023, I'm only going places that I am stoked. Right. To go and if to. people want to come, great. If not, you're going to enjoy it anyway. Exactly. I actually have a secret trip. So sorry, guys, this is sold out. I, it was a invite only and I'm taking women to the south of Italy. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, this is this has been a fantastic conversation. If people want to get in touch with you is the best way through your website, which is Sarah with an HD Weaver dot com. Yes, that's the best place. And then also on Instagram, if they message me, I really do read all of my DMs. And it's also Sarah D. Weaver. So please reach out if I said anything of interest on this podcast, or you have any questions or want to yell at me about something, please <laughs> reach out. I love hearing from you guys. Yeah, that's how we got in touch. I find that like appropriate Instagram DMing is a great way to connect with people. It's just, I get like hundreds of DMs a day that are completely fake. But going through the presentation is important to connect with people. And it's good. I still read all mine too as well because I think it's important to see what's there and you said that you may have a code for 30 day stay for people who want to buy your and Ziana's book which is a bigger pockets book on midterm rentals which is awesome I finished it I had like two chapters left when I did the recording with Ziana and then I immediately finished it so I really got a lot out of it it was both you guys and you had a lot of other guests in there who gave their experience I think it's a great book for people to learn the ins and outs of midterm rentals Thank you so much. Yes. Anyone listening, if you use Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, you will get 10% off 30-day stay at the Bigger Pockets store. Awesome. Sarah, it's been an absolute pleasure. The last thing I'm going to get from you, if you had one piece of advice for just new real estate investors in this current market, what would you tell them based on your experience over the last few years? Don't wait especially don't wait if until you feel ready. You will never feel ready. So just don't wait. That's my advice for life. If there's something that you want to do, if you've always wanted to go on an African safari, don't wait. Just sign up. If you have someone in your life that you haven't been telling that you love or your true feelings, don't wait. I was unfortunately in a, a near fatal car accident in high school and I think that has been my motto ever since is you just, tomorrow's not guaranteed, you guys. And so don't wait. And real estate in investors, if you've already determined that you're, you've decided that you're going to invest in real estate, don't wait. Write offers, get under contract. I hope they're listening. But I think they can just go on your website, watch what you do and see that it can be done. And that's a motivating factor for a lot who are waiting on the sidelines. This is a wake up call. I hope they're going to listen. Me too. Yeah. Sarah, it was an absolute pleasure. I appreciate you being on the show and it was fantastic to meet you. I look forward to staying in touch. We're going to have to do that speaker thing so we can have that trade off of INTJ and the extrovert. That would be awesome. Excellent. Sounds good. Awesome. This has been episode 27 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Sarah Weaver. We'll see you next week. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green. And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part, I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends, and be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening. 